Πολύ ωραία. Ε, η ομιλία σήμερα του Μανώλη Κέλλη είναι, έχει τίτλο «From Genomics to Therapeutics, Single Cell Dissection or Manipulation of Disease Circuitry». Και είναι μια μεγάλη ευκαιρία αυτός ο εξαίρετος επιστήμονας και ομιλητής να μας δώσει την δύναμη της πληροφορικής α, και α, της επιστήμης των υπολογιστών στην ιατρική και το impact που μπορεί να έχει στην ιατρική και την αξία της διεπιστημονικής έρευνας. Θα σας δώσω κάποιες πληροφορίες βιογραφικές του Μανώλη. Ο Μανώλη Σκέλης είναι προφέσος του Computer Science στο MIT και μέλος του Broad Institute του MIT και του Harvard. Uh, PI uh, στο so C-Sales στο MIT και Head του Computational Biology Group. Uh, η έρευνα του uh, περιλαμβάνει disease circuitry, uh, uh, γενετική, genomics, epigenomics, coding genes, non-coding RNAs, regulatory genomics and comparative genomics uh, που εφαρμόζονται σε πάρα πολλούς, σε πολλές ασθένειες όπως είναι το Alzheimer, obesity, σχιζοφρένεια. Έχει υλοποιήσει πάρα πολλά projects σε genomics που περιλαμβάνουν το Roadmap Epigenomics Project, το ENCODE Project, το Genotype Tissue Expression Project. Uh, και επίση έχει λάβει πάρα πολύ σημαντικά βραβεία, uh, όπως για παράδειγμα το U.S. Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, uh, που, δίνεται από το, uh, που δόθηκε από τον U.S. President Barack Obama, το Mental Mental for Outstanding Achievements in Science, το NSF Career Award, uh, το Alfred Sloan Fellowship, Um, um, βραβεία για την καλύτερη uh, διδακτορική διατριβή του, στο Computer Science στο MIT. Um, έχει συγγράψει πάνω από 240 journal publications και έχει γίνει cited more than, περισσότερο από 120.000 φορές. Um, έχει πάρει πολλαπλά um, μακροχρόνια uh, grants από το NIH και από άλλους οργανισμούς και ε, οι φοιτητέ του είναι τώρα καθηγητέ στο Stanford, στο Harvard, στο CMU, στο McGill, στο John Hopkins, στο UCLA και σε άλλα κορυφαία πανεπιστήμια. Α, έχει ζήσει στην Ελλάδα α, και στη Γαλλία πριν μετακινηθεί στην Αμερική, όπου σπούδασε α, και έκανε έρευνα στο MIT, στο Xerox α, Palo Alto Research Center και στο Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Α, Μανώλη, ο λόγος είναι τώρα δικό σου. Ανυπομονούμε να σε ακούσουμε και να απολαύσουμε όλα αυτά τα σημαντικά που έχεις κάνει με την ομάδα σου. Σε ευχαριστούμε Έχει. πολύ για την πρόσκληση. Να αναφέρω τελειώνοντας ότι αυτή η ομιλία γίνεται recorded και επίσης θα ήθελα να σας ενθαρρύνω, όπως μου ζήτησε και ο ίδιος ο ομιλητής μας, να απευθύνετε ερωτήσεις. Θα είναι το καλύτερο αν μπορείτε να τις γράψετε στο chat και μετά εγώ ή ο ίδιος ο ομιλητής θα τις διαβάσει και θα τις απαντήσει. Λοιπόν, σας ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και η κυρία Παπαδοπούλη και η κυρία Ζουρό για την πολύ πολύ θερμή πρόσκληση. Ε, ομολογώ ότι... Και με λύπη και με χαρά δέχομαι το Zoom meeting. Πρώτον, είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο να έρθω. Αλλά δεύτερον, θα χαρώ πολύ περισσότερο να σας δω και απευθείας. Και ελπίζω το επόμενο καλοκαίρι να μπορέσουμε να βρεθούμε κάθε χρόνο με την οικογένειά μου. Πρέπει δύο μήνες στην Ελλάδα. Η Ελλάδα είναι πολύ κοντά στην καρδιά μας. Και θα χαρώ πάρα πολύ και συνεργασίες να έχουμε επιστημονικές, αλλά και προσωπικές συναντήσεις και στην Αθήνα και στην Κρήτη. Λοιπόν, ε, αυτό που θέλω να σας πω σήμερα είναι για, το, για τη δουλειά που κάνουμε, για το πώς μπορούμε να μεταφράσουμε τη γονιδιωματική σε μηχανισμούς για το πώς δουλεύει η ασθένεια και πώς μπορούμε να χρησιμοποιήσουμε αυτό για να ε, μπορέσουμε να οργανώσουμε καινούριε θεραπείες, όχι μόνο για μία ασθένεια, αλλά για όλες τις ασθένειες. So I'm going to switch to English for the rest of my talk. So basically, how do we understand both dissect disease circuitry and also manipulate disease circuitry at single cell resolution to translate genomics into therapeutics. So the understanding of genetics 
doesn't uh, date to the last century. It, it goes back thousands of years. For thousands of years, humans have selectively bred animals and plants to go from wolves that would eat you to man's best friend, to go from inedible plants to something that forms the basis of uh, sugar production and, and food production in many countries, to go and select sheep that have unnaturally abundant wool. So the selective of breeding, uh, breeding of animals and plants has been around for thousands of years. And the realization that eye and hair color are inherited between generations has long been understood. In fact, in ancient Greece, there were several philosophers who had major insights that the first human, for example, was born from a non-human relative, understanding the concept of evolution many, many centuries before Darwin, that there was a fish origin of land mammals. Back in 300 BC, there was the first taxonomy of species and classification by Aristotle. And the, the seeds that were planted were followed by many, many additional scientists. In fact, in 450 BC, Empedocles uh, foreshadowed Darwinian theory by talking about this random mixing of traits that there's natural variation and that the successful ones survive, giving the semblance of purpose, something that again, uh, you know, speaking at a Darwinian uh, Monday, is very difficult not to mention. And of course, this was uh, also followed with Epicurus of a concept of a purely naturalistic generation of diversity without any supernatural intervention. So again, this precedes the Renaissance by many, many years. And that's why it's called, after all, the Renaissance. And of course, at the same time, Plato and the Stoics and religion and Christianity had a very opposite view of creation rather than uh, evolution. So uh, this concept where boiling still in the 19th century with Lamarck, with Lamarck uh, in Lamarck, in transmutation, adaptation, uh, that would be spontaneously generating more complex forms from simple forms. And that was the prevailing theory when Darwin came about. And Darwin basically gave this concept of a continuum of species, that random mutation would basically generate diversity and natural selection would select from that diversity for fitness. And again, Darwin was a, a towering figure at the time and, and had many, many lasting contributions. But his theory also had several holes. So he was basically imagining that many gemules would come from all over the body and eventually give rise to the embryo. And that would eventually lead to blending inheritance. And there was a lot of Lamarckism where traits from the environment would be passed on to the progeny uh, through this egg. So Darwin himself recognized the limitations, but what he did not realize is that on his desk was sitting an unopened envelope from Mendel that was describing his theory of inheritance, of discrete particulate inheritance, not blending inheritance anymore. There was no blending. There were discrete units that we now know of as genes and dominant and recessive alleles and the concept of independent assortment that you can mix and match traits for different types of color or you know, multiple traits, and you would get a digital inheritance. And of course, Mendel himself was unhappy with his theory, just as Darwin could see the flaws of his theory, because this was contrasted with what people had long realized that in fact, eye color is not black or white. It's, you know, a, almost a continuum between the different colors. That hair color is again almost a continuum. So there was this observation of a continuous phenotypic variation that had a lot of trouble uh, reconciling and many, many theories were prevailing at the same time uh, as you know, Darwin had his major, major uh, theory of evolution. So this was all resolved at the beginning of this century in 1905 and later synthesized in 1918 by Fisher explaining how continuous phenotypic variation could be explained simply by multiple Mendelian loci. And that's key to understanding inheritance today, that what we're looking at as almost a continuous variation in height, in disease predisposition, in 
cognitive traits, in schizophrenia, in Alzheimer's, in obesity, this continuous variation is in fact the result of many Mendelian loci, each of them acting in discrete ways. This was followed by, of course, the realization that chromosomes is the place where the genetic material resides and ultimately the structure of DNA and its basis for inheritance and the ability to start mapping genetic traits based on the uh, deviation actually from the rules that Mendel had set. The fact that loci near each other on the chromosome would be co-inherited, uh, that these traits would be co-inherited more often. And that basically led to linkage mapping in the 80s that gave rise to many genetic loci that were strongly associated with disease. And the next transformation came with the Human Genome Project in the early 2000s, where we now had a reference for the entire human genome sequence. And having that reference was groundbreaking because we could now start understanding genetic variation across the human population and map all that variation on variation maps. We could start building haplotypes within which we could place common variants and common variation that is inherited in blocks. And the workhorse of human genetics, which is now genome-wide association studies, was possible by looking at common variants across the entire genome in a simple statistical test to look for association. And the power of these approaches is that it doesn't matter what genes are made of. It doesn't matter if you understand the mechanism or not. You can discover completely de novo an association with any trait if you have a large enough number of individuals. The transitions that we're seeing now is with the advent of whole genome sequencing, for much, much cheaper, we can now move beyond just common variants and start incorporating rare variants. And this is basically what these uh, studies result in. This is the worst part of my own genome. If you look at my genetic variants associated with age-related macular degeneration, I have inherited three risk alleles in these three genes, ARMS2, TMP3, and then C2 which are basically dramatically increasing my risk for age-related macular degeneration, a form of blindness that will give me an 8% chance of losing the central part of my vision as I age, whereas all of you guys on the Zoom line only have uh, a 6% chance, or so I have a slightly increased risk because of these mutations. So the big question that we all have is, all right, great, what can we do about it? So I like to say that human genetics suffers from Cassandra syndrome, the ability to predict the future, but not be able to do anything about it because nobody will believe uh, Cassandra. And for human genetics, you can predict that, yes, you have a predisposition, but can you go beyond that? Can you actually act on it? And that's the challenge that my group is uh, addressing. So we're starting with this genome-wide association study results. What I'm showing you here is a Manhattan plot. It's a simple chi-square statistical test for every single nucleotide in the genome, in these genotyping arrays. We're talking about 6 million independent genetic loci containing many, many SNPs, many, many single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, for each of them. And then the genomic position on the x-axis and the association with a trait on the y-axis. Here I'm showing you obesity or body mass index, a quantitative measure uh, related with obesity. And you can see here the strongest genetic association is in this FTO locus. This was initially named fused toes O. And everybody started paying attention to this gene when this was discovered back in 2007 because you now have a candidate new genetic locus. So everybody said, okay, great, let's go after this gene, develop new therapeutics enable precision medicine, maybe even personalized medicine, and understand the mechanism of this disease. But the challenge, however, is that in 93% of cases, these genetic associations that we're discovering do not affect proteins directly. If you look at this FTO locus associated with obesity, you see that there are 89 common variants within this 50,000 nucleotide region. All of them are falling within the first intra, and a small part of the second intron, and you see these tiny little dots, these are the exons, that's the protein coding part of the FTO gene. So that basically means that these genetic variants do not affect the FTO gene and the FTO protein directly. So the question is, 
what do they do? They might be gene regulatory variants for that gene, but what we showed in our own work is that the true targets of this regulatory region are in fact several genes over, 1.2 million nucleotides away. And the challenge here is that this is not an exception. This is very much the rule. For 93% of genome-wide association studies, the disease hits are non-coding. That means we don't know the target gene, we don't know the causal variant, we don't know the cell type of action, we don't know the relevant pathways, and we don't know the mechanism. So what my research group is trying to do is overcome these challenges systematically. And how do we do that? We start with human disease genetics. We, we start with both common and rare variants and their association. Here I'm showing you a different genome-wide association study plot for Alzheimer's disease. And you can see here apolipoprotein E as the strongest genetic association in chromosome 19. We start with these genetic associations, and then we systematically profile the molecular changes that are associated with these differences. So we profile the RNA, namely the gene expression levels, and the epigenome, namely the gene regulatory circuitry. So as you know, DNA is not floating around naked inside the nucleus. It is packaged up in chromatin in these bundles of 200 nucleotides called nucleosomes that can undergo a large number of modifications. You can think of them as colors of chromatin. And these modifications help denote enhancers that I'm gonna be showing in orange, promoters in red, transcribe regions in green, repressed regions in gray. So every region, every 200 nucleotide chunk of the human genome is in fact annotated, decorated, according to the function that it plays in that cell type. This epigenome and this epigenomic variation is what allows the diversity, the incredible diversity of cell types we have in the human body. The fact that my neuronal cells look completely different from my microglia, from my liver cells, from my nails, from my eyelids, from my retina, all of these incredible diversity of blood and tissue cell types are enabled by the quote-unquote epigenetic memory that the epigenome has. And we can read that memory systematically by profiling DNA accessible regions, by profiling DNA methylation, and pro by profiling histone modifications. So in my group, we have carried out thousands of these experiments across many different reference tissues and also across thousands of individuals looking at both RNA variation for the gene expression and epigenomic variation for the circuitry. And we're doing this in healthy individuals to understand how genetic variants lead to genetically associated variation in these intermediate molecular traits to effectively understand how are the genetic variants associated with APOE or with FTO are in fact leading to gene expression changes and epigenomic changes in the individuals that carry the risk mutations. But we also carry these studies in disease samples to understand what are the intermediate paths on the way to disease, but also what are the consequences of disease on the cells of those individuals in addition to the genetic risk itself, because many environmental variables can lead to disease, which can then have an impact on both the transcriptome and the epigenome. So we generate a lot of data within my research team, but the goal is of course data integration. So we are primarily a computational team even though the vast majority of our budget is spent on uh, data generation. We then integrate these data computationally to predict machine learning models for how the genome actually works. How does every nucleotide mutation impact the function of that genomic region and ultimately the functional consequences at the epigenome, at the transcriptome, and at the cellular level on the way to the disease association? So we predict driver genes, regions, cell types, and their mechanistic basis. And of course, we have a large number of collaborations, both within my lab and in many collaborating labs, to validate our predictions in human cells and in mouse models. So we use human cell cultures, we use human, uh, humanized mouse models, as well as um, a diversity of extremely high throughput tools for testing these variations, and of course, disseminate the results and start all over again. What do these methods allow us to do? They allow us to go beyond simply a region of association. 
they allow us to start thinking about a circuitry. And what do I mean by circuitry? We basically can take a genetic region associated with disease. This region is associated with cholesterol and it has four common variants. Instead of just saying, oh, there's something going on somewhere in the neighborhood of this gene, we can basically say, where do these genetic variants lie? They fall within these enhancer gene regulatory regions. They are controlled by upstream regulators recognizing these motifs. These regions are extremely variable between cell types. So in liver, in embryonic stem cells, in T cells, in placenta, they have completely different profiles, enabling us to start predicting where are these nucleotide variants acting in terms of tissues and cell types, who are their upstream control regions, what are the individual motifs that are disrupted by these nucleotide variants, enabling us to pinpoint candidate causal nucleotides whose single nucleotide alteration should be able to recapitulate the genetic association with the disease and the molecular consequences of that association, and what are the target genes. So in this particular case, only this variant is predicted to target the AFF1 gene, but in fact, these other variants are predicted to target other genes in that general vicinity. So applying these methods to the FTO locus that I showed you on the first slide, we were able to show that the strongest genetic association with obesity in this FTO region is in fact, can be pinpointed to a single nucleotide alteration. So from these 50,000 nucleotides that were in the region of association, we're able to go to a single nucleotide, which disrupts a AT rich motif by changing this T into a C for 40% of European chromosomes, 44% of Southeast Asian chromosomes, but only 2% of African chromosomes. So I carry two risk alleles of the obesity locus. So that basically means that I am predisposed to obesity. Neither of my parents have that exact combination, but I inherited both versions of the risk alleles so both, for both copies. What happens in my cells? The AT-rich motif that this AT-rich interacting domain protein, ARID5B, normally binds is no longer able to bind. So what happens? What happens is that there's a 12,000 nucleotide enhancer in my adipocytes, in my fat cells, that can no longer be shut off. So this ARID5B gene normally represses that super enhancer, and it can no longer do that when that motif is gone. So what happens with this is no longer binding. That means that the enhancer is derepressed, so it's overactivated. And the two target genes, IRX3 and IRX5, which are sitting 1.2 million nucleotides away, are in fact increasing by expression uh, by a factor of two. What do these genes do? These were not previously known regulators. I mean, they were known as master regulators, but what we found is that they play a new role that was previously unsuspected in the first three days of adipocyte differentiation. So your fat cells are renewed constantly. And every time they're being renewed in the first three days of differentiation, they can decide to either activate a lipogenic program where your white adipocytes will store excess calories in your diet every day as lipids in these giant white fat cells, which um, will basically make us sick eventually, or they can decide to burn these calories through a large number of processes, including uh, thermogenesis in the depolarization of mitochondrial membranes. So fat cells are both able to store energy and they're also able to burn energy. These are white fat cells. The burning cells are known as either browning or beiging cells. And by depolarizing the mitochondrial membrane, they lead to a loss of the proton gradient that is responsible for this energy creation and this lipid storage. And uncoupling protein one is one of the many regulators along with PGC1 alpha and others that are basically leading to this process. So what we found is that these master regulators are unable to turn on thermogenesis. They are stuck in a lipogenic position for the obese individuals. So this is really a mistake of the circuitry, not of a broken protein or a broken gene. This is really a broken circuit. And that's at the basis of 93% of the genetic variants in the genome. 
So what does understanding the circuitry mean? It means that we can manipulate that circuitry. We can basically now go and intervene because we understand the upstream regulator. We understand the downstream target genes. So we can pharmaceutically go in and increase or decrease the expression of these targets. And we can also, to validate our findings, use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to trace that single nucleotide alteration and its effects on obesity. What we found is that if we edit a single nucleotide in cells from homozygous risk individuals like myself, we can take primary adipocytes from these individuals, from the white fat tissue of these individuals, including myself, and we can basically alter out of 3 billion nucleotides in the human genome, alter a single letter. And that single letter alteration by restoring the T allele and therefore restoring the motif for this AT rich interacting domain protein, we can effectively restore thermogenesis measured as relative oxygen consumption rate uncoupled as percent of basal. And this is you know, very much true in the basal condition. There's already a very significant increase in the basal but it really becomes stronger with isoproteranol stimulation, which basically restores thermogenesis, increasing it by a factor of seven and restoring it to the non-risk levels. So we're basically switching the cellular phenotype from obese to lean with a single letter alteration. We're able to go a lot further. We're able to take now the downstream target genes that are overexpressed in obese individuals and repress them we can basically create a dominant negative construct for IRX3 under the control of these uh, adipose-specific promoter. And what we see is that the mice lose 50% of their body weight. If you look at their fat stores, they are completely depleted. They have zero fat in their body. And what's remarkable is that even when you put them in a high-fat diet, the normal mice gain weight, but these mice are unable to gain weight. So we went from just a general association with the FTO locus to a very specific circuit that doesn't even feature the FTO gene because the true targets are far, far away and the upstream regulator is yet in another chromosome. And we're able to now trace that to a very specific manipulation and create therapeutics. And that's what we want to do systematically for every single genetic association in the genome. To do this, we are building a series of resources we're basically building reference epigenomes to predict disease-relevant tissues. We're combining genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptional variation, both in healthy and disease individuals. We're carrying out an immense number of single-cell profiles of both the epigenome and the transcriptome across individuals to understand cell type-specific genetic effects by integrating the single-cell data with bulk data, with genome-wide association studies, and with quantitative trait loci. We're carrying this out across many different phenotypes by integrating systematically with medical records. And we're doing this across multiple tissues to understand the systemic disorders like Alzheimer's and, and obesity and how they're acting across many cell types and many tissues simultaneously. And then we're also developing high throughput methods to dissect that circuitry, 7 million experiments at a time rather than one experiment at a time. So I'll give you a very quick preview of all of these different uh, bodies of work, but uh, I just want to sort of whet your imaginations and your appetite and uh, just give you a glimpse of what we're working on. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to dive into any of those uh, in the questions. So the first challenge is how do we build these reference epigenomes to understand the circuitry of the different cell types? So as part of the epigenome roadmap project and the ENCODE project, we and many other collaborators have built the largest map of the human epigenome. This was published in Nature back in 2005. We have recently published an update of this in Nature again, just a few months ago. And this is looking at the promoter, enhancer, transcription, polycom repressed, heterochromatin, both promoter and enhancer activation histone modification marks as well as DNA accessibility, DNA manipulation, and gene expression. Using these maps, we can now paint the epigenome of every single cell type across hundreds of cell types and across the entire genome. We can see how promoters are extremely stable. We can see how enhancers in orange are very dynamic. We can see in green how transcribed genes are turning on and off. 
you can see repressed regions in brain and how, for example, this Pax5 gene is only getting de-repressed going from right to left here from the red promoter to the enhancer marks in the first intron to ultimately the transcribed marks in the body of the gene in only a handful of cell types. And most importantly, we can take non-coding regions, for example, in this interval here, that are associated with disease and say, well, what could be the target genes and where are they turning on? And what we're seeing is that, number one, we can predict the cell types of action in this particular case, immune cells for this region. But number two, we can look for correlated genes whose expression turns on when these enhancer regions turn on and start mapping non-coding regions to their target genes that can be far, far away, as I showed you earlier in the case of the FTO locus. We can then take these annotations of the epigenome and overlay them with annotations of genetic variants underlying a, complex, a series of complex disorders. If you take genetic variants associated with height, they paint very different regions of the genome than genetic variants associated with type 1 diabetes or blood pressure or cholesterol. And that's exciting because we can now start asking, where are the enhancers active in stem cells overlapping? And the enhancers active in immune cells and the enhancers active in heart and in liver. And what we're seeing is that there's a very specific association between genetic variants associated with height and enhancers active in stem cells, leading us to postulate that maybe height is acting in embryonic stem cells and of course, early in development, exactly as we would expect. And that type one diabetes is acting in immune cells and blood pressure is acting in heart and cholesterol is acting in liver. So we can do this across dozens of different traits by taking all of the genetic associations with those traits and then hundreds of different cell types and then painting this diagonal picture that allows us to see where are these traits acting. So for example, if you look at fasting glucose related traits a mark of type two diabetes, you see that pancreatic islets, enhancers active in pancreatic islets are the strongest genetic association and enrichment exactly as you would expect based on the biology of the disease. Cholesterol, very specifically enriched in liver. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you have both inflammatory for T cells and in, in immune cells and bowel disease for the internal organs and the digestive tract. If you look at Alzheimer's disease, you would expect to see an association specifically in the brain, but you don't see that. Instead, you see that Alzheimer's disease variants are enriched in enhancers active in CD14 plus immune cells. This is a mark of monocytes, which are circulating in your blood, and also tissue resident macrophages, which are found, for example, in your adipose tissue, M1 versus M2 macrophages are associated with obesity. And most importantly, the resident macrophages of the brain, known as microglia, are the resident immune cells of the brain. And that suggests that perhaps Alzheimer's is very specifically acting, not through the neurons, but through the microglia in the brain. And indeed, we sorted cells from bulk brain, and we sorted neur neurons versus microglia versus oligodendrocytes, and we saw that the genetic association is very specific to microglia the immune cells of the brain. So that suggests that uh, Alzheimer's is in fact having an immune basis. And again, we published a nature paper back in 2015, indicating that by looking at both mice and humans, we can predict an immune basis of Alzheimer's disease. And this is now of course, a major focus in the community. And there in the mice, we saw that early in disease progression, you only could see changes in immune cells, but later in disease progression, you see changes in the neuronal uh, pathways and processes, indicating that inflammation might in fact be the causal component of Alzheimer's prior to amyloid and tau and all of the later symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned just a few months ago, we updated this map from 127 epigenomes to 834 epigenomes, going from 54 enriched traits to 534 enriched traits, looking at the full network of which genetic traits are enriched in which cell types and tissues. And every one of those is in fact a Venn diagram showing what is the diversity of tissues associated with any one of these traits. You can see, for example, in brain, you have schizophrenia, neuroticism, and also intelligence, math ability, localizing 
in brain enhancers. By contrast, Alzheimer's localizes here in the immune cell instead. With kidney, you have a lot of filtration traits. With liver, you have a lot of cholesterol traits and so on and so forth. Focusing in on one of these associations right here for coronary artery disease, this is in fact the most pleiotropic trait. This is the trait that has the, the most number of factors that are associated. And what we're able to do is now use that to start partitioning that complexity into its components. We can basically take the subset of genetic variants associated with coronary artery disease and start mapping them into either liver enhancers or coronary artery enhancers and so on and so forth. And what that does is it allows us to find distinct biological enrichments for each of these pathways and start going through individual genetic loci and start predicting whether they're acting through the liver, such as the example of PCSK9, one of the strongest uh, success stories of human genetics, EDNRA acting through the heart, and PLPP3, which appears to be acting both in the liver and in the coronary artery, giving us an example of both a multi-gene and a multi-tissue pleiotropy, where different divergently transcribed genes appear to be associated with the same genetic locus, leading to disease predisposition in multiple tissues simultaneously. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about comparative genomics in a Darwin lecture. So we've also been annotating the human genome using a series of evolutionary signatures by studying how are genetic regions evolving? How are they changing between closely related species? And then using that to annotate protein coding signatures versus non-coding signatures, RNA structures, microRNAs, and most importantly, regulatory motifs based on their unique and distinct patterns of evolutionary conservation between species. That allows us to now focus from the 3 billion letters of, a of the human genome to a much smaller subset of evolutionary conserved nucleotides that are much more likely to be functionally important. That allows us to go into regions of transcription factor binding and pinpoint individual motifs that are evolutionarily conserved based on their specific patterns of conservation. That allows us to now start pinpointing genetic variants that disrupt these motifs as more likely to be causal for the disease association than other nucleotides that do not overlap evolutionarily conserved elements. And in particular, during the current COVID-19 pandemic, We've been using comparative genomics to understand the SARS-CoV-2 genome through the lens of evolutionary variation. So again, there's only 29,000 nucleotides in the COVID-19 genome compared to 3 billion nucleotides for the human genome. We're talking about a factor of 100,000 smaller. And yet there are many hypothetical open reading frames which are not yet known to be genes. So what we did is that we built evolutionary comparisons of 44 closely related genomes of the SARS-CoV viruses, the SARS-related beta coronaviruses, and then use that to start understanding the evolutionary signatures associated with every region of the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And in particular, we're able to, for example, show that ORF10, one of the 29 genes that were annotated on this genome, is in fact not a protein coding gene at all is very strongly conserved at the nucleotide level, but it shows no protein coding signatures, indicating that it's perhaps a non-coding RNA function. We were able to actually discover a new gene within the ORF3A protein. We're able to find another gene is in fact encoded within a different reading frame. And you can see here the evolutionary conservation in both reading frames shows these very clear signatures of protein coding selection. We're also able to look at the evolutionary rate with which these genes have been changing between related genomes, and then compare that to the rate at which they're changing within the current pandemic, within the single nucleotide variants of the current pandemic. And what we're finding, for example, is that the S1 protein evolves much slower than what you would have expected, whereas the nucleocapsid protein that the RNA is wrapped around in the genome appears to be evolving much, much faster than you would have expected. And indeed, this contains one of the fastest evolving regions of the genome, which appears to be evading our immune system that basically is a, is a uh, epithelium or one of our uh, immune cells.
we're also able to use the evolutionary conservation patterns of these 44 uh, genomes to start studying the mutations that are occurring during the current pandemic and that are rising to high frequency. For example, the D614G mutation rose in frequency independently in many different cities back in May 2000 and is now the dominant mutation across the entire pandemic. And what we saw is that this mutation had never happened. This residue was never changed. And it was sitting in a stretch of 11 amino acids, none of which had ever been mutated across all of these different genomes. So that suggests that this might actually represent a human host adaptation, whereas in fact, all of the bad infecting genomes had never in fact changed that uh, position. So this is basically building a reference map of the human genome and other genomes using epigenomics and using comparative genomics. We've also started understanding how this map changes from person to person by combining genetic variation across individuals with epigenetic and transcriptional variation to bridge the gap between genetic variation and ultimately disease by understanding what are the tissues in which these genetic, these genetic variants are acting what are the gene regulatory changes at the epigenomic level? What are the gene expression changes that are happening in consequence? And lastly, what are the endophenotypes on the way to disease? So we can start mapping individual genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's with, for example, a brain enhancer, a neighboring gene expression change, and ultimately amyloid beta and so on and so forth. And of course, the environment is acting on each of these intermediate variables. And of course, disease itself might be responsible for the gene expression changes rather than the other way around. The example I like to say to give is that uh, firemen are always found near fires. That doesn't mean that they are the arsonists. They're there to put out the fires. So in some cases, gene expression will increase with disease, but that's in fact combating disease. So we have to be careful and understand the causality rather than just correlations. And the way we do that is by combining genetic variation in the context of the epigenomic and transcriptional variation and phenotype to infer causality by combining these variables. How do we do that? By first predicting the epigenome from the genome and discovering methylation quantitative trait loci. That means that across the genome, I can find tens of thousands of genetic variants where at birth, if I know the genotype of that baby, even at conception, I can predict their epigenome of their brain of an inaccessible tissue at 93 years of age. So that basically means that I can start asking what is the genetic component of that methylation. And if I do that across enough loci across the genome, I can start bridging that gap from G to D, from genetics to disease by inferring, for example, methylation through these methyl TTLs, methylation quantitative trait loci, predicting the methylation, and then just like a genome-wide association study correlates genetics with disease, a methylome-wide association study correlates methylation with disease. But that's a bi-directional arrow because some of those methylation changes might be a consequence of disease. If instead I look at the G2M to predict methylation. This is not all of methylation. This is just the genetic component of methylation. So I can then correlate that predicted methylation with disease and get a unidirectional arrow because that predicted methylation is at conception. It's not a consequence of the disease. So doing this across the genome, I can find additional loci that are now genome-wide significant because I'm testing many fewer hypotheses and because I'm combining multiple SNPs together. And I can do this across genetics, methylation, transcriptome, and ultimately disease. This allows me to now predict many additional genetic loci that are causally associated with disease with the specific gene that we predict is targeted and the tissue where it acts and the directionality of effect. And I can do this both in genome-wide significant loci in purple, as well as uh, novel risk loci in gray that are not individually genome-wide significant. But all of what I've showed you so far has been at the tissue level. And of course, our brain, as I showed earlier, is dramatically different between the different cell types. We show that genetic association with Alzheimer's localized to the microglia, not all of the neurons. 
So we have now started a very large program to look at single cell changes for both the epigenome and the transcriptome in the context of disease. We basically started looking across many different traits, including Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, Huntington's, schizophrenia, bipolar, autism, uh, depression, obesity, and many other traits, heart disease. Across many, many individuals, we now have 1,500 postmortem human brain samples. And each trait across many uh, individuals, many cell types, many individual cells, 20 million cells for some of these studies, and then multiple regions of the brain and multiple tissues in the body, and looking at both single cell RNA as well as single cell DNA accessibility. That basically tells us for each cell, where are the DNA accessible regions? That allows us to start understanding disease systematically at the single nucleotide resolution. So the first study that we published in this area was back in Nature in uh, 2019, in collaboration with Li Hui Tsai, Hans Reddy Mathis, and Jose Davila. We basically looked at 84,000 cells from 48 individuals, including non-AD, early AD, and late AD individuals. You can see here how cognition starts dropping and how all of these pathological signatures of Alzheimer's starts increasing across the different groups. What we found is that every major cell type shows transcriptional alterations, not just the microglia. And if we cluster excitatory neurons into two parts, we find that some of them are very strongly associated with Alzheimer's and some of them are not at all. And remarkably, what you find is that female individuals have many more of these disease-associated cells whereas male individuals have many fewer of those cells. We also found early versus late changes in Alzheimer's are extremely cell type specific at first. And then later on, you see a lot of genes turning on associated with damage response, given all of the havoc is being, that's being wrecked on those cells. And we also found that men and women show thousands of gene expression differences even before Alzheimer's, but that number doubles with Alzheimer's disease indicating that we should be thinking a lot about sex-specific and cell-type-specific changes in disease. In particular, we found that men upregulated myelin pathways, leading to perhaps protection and, uh, of the white matter, whereas women do not. And indeed, we found a lot more white matter loss in women, uh, indicating that perhaps we should be thinking about sex-specific therapeutic uh, avenues. We have since that study expanded to many more regions of the brain. We now have 1.6 million cells across seven different brain regions, each in 48 individuals, looking at the incredible diversity of neuronal subclasses and also glial subclasses across the different brain regions. We're finding 30 different subtypes of excitatory neurons and 23 subtypes of inhibitory neurons across the different brain regions. And we're also finding that there's a lot of inter-region variation not just in excitatory neurons as we had expected, but also in inhibitory neurons and glial cells and so on and so forth. What we can also do with this large number of cells is start, is start building computational models of AD progression, of Alzheimer's disease progression at the single cell level. We can start sorting all of, this, all of these cells by building predictive functions of Alzheimer's from the transcriptome and applying these functions to every cell giving us an ordering of all of the cells and allowing us to now start asking what regions, what individuals, what genes and what pathways are in fact early versus middle versus late in the disease process. We're able to start studying the spatial organization and the anatomical subregions of, for example, here, the hippocampal structure that allows us to now start predicting which subregions of the brain are in fact most associated with Alzheimer's disease. We're able to take bulk data from spatial transcriptomics and deconvolve it into individual cells. And we're able to augment single cell profiles with spatial information using a deep learning model that predicts the spatial positioning of every cell based on their transcriptional profiles. And we can now start correlating oligodendrocytes and astrocytes and other glial cells with neuronal targets and their co-variation indicating cell-cell communication. In uh, schizophrenia, we're able to now start looking at new subtypes that are vulnerable in schizophrenia and that are often associated with these transcriptional profiles that otherwise look normal, except for this one cell type that is very highly predictive of schizophrenia, 
for individuals that have a normal transcriptome. We're able to go into the genetics of schizophrenia and start asking for every genetic locus, what are candidate target genes based on their dysregulation, either positively or negatively with schizophrenia and start predicting the cell types where these are acting. We're able to now use this information to start predicting the upstream regulators of schizophrenia and start thinking about points of intervention that can now start changing entire sub-circuits of dozens of target genes based on the expression of these controlling regulators. And what we found is that these regulators are acting both in early development and in the adult, looking at these shared transcription programs that are connecting neurodevelopment and synaptic organization with schizophrenia. We're able to uh, classify subtypes of microglia. These are these rare immune cell types, but they play a diversity of roles. And we're able to distinguish, for example, pro-inflammatory microglia that are associated with Alzheimer's, but synaptic transmission microglia that are instead enriched in schizophrenia, both for genome-wide association and for differentially expressed genes. The vasculature of the brain is immensely complex with many different subtypes of neural endothelial and fibroblast cells. And each of these is zonated between the arterial, the capillaries and the venue where the blood is flowing through the brain. Enabling us to now start studying how are each of these subtypes of cells associated with, with Alzheimer's, with schizophrenia and with other disorders. In fact, there's major vasculature risk for example, type 2 diabetes is very strongly associated with Alzheimer's disease. And what we're finding is that lipid dysregulation in the vessels is in fact uh, probably at the root of this association. And again, I want to emphasize that apolipoprotein E, ApoE4, is in fact the strongest association. That's a lipid transporter that is again implicating lipid pathways. We're able to predict cell-cell communications between both uh, these ligand receptor target gene connections across the vasculature that is involved in pathogen sensing across microglia, astrocyte and feet, and ultimately neuronal health. And we're now looking at the impact of pathogens in the brain. And specifically, for example, COVID-19 uh, has been shown to enter the brain. And uh, for example, in the 1918 pandemic, there was a major increase in neurodegeneration after that pandemic for everyone who was infected. And one major hypothesis is currently that amyloid beta is in fact, in fact a micro, microbial response and microbial defense organism against both uh, bacteria and viruses potentially getting uh, activated during viral infections. Looking at the DNA accessibility patterns and correlating them with the single cell expression pattern, we can start connecting non coding variants in this example associated with schizophrenia to candidate target genes and the cell types in which they're acting. We're able to look at correlated activity between expression changes and DNA accessibility changes and start looking at that across many different subtypes of the brain. We're able to localize genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's to individual enhancers active in microglia and predict the upstream regulators of those. In this particular case, PU.1, also known as FPI1, which is very strongly enriched 10 to the minus 2,634 in microglia peaks associated with genetic variants associated with Alzheimer's. We're also able to look at single cell transcriptional changes indicative of mosaicism, where multiple cells are accumulating additional mutations during their replication and those mutations are much more abundant in disease-associated neurons and much more abundant in amyloid and cognitive decline individuals, and also different between female and male individuals, and in some cases showing clonal expansions in those cells that are now losing the ability to correct these mutations. We're also looking at cell type-specific genetic effects by integrating both single cell data and bulk data together to increase the sample size to 3,000 individuals and again, we're finding that these genetic mutations are localizing specifically within microglia for many of the uh, risk loci. Integrating with medical records, we're able to look at the subtypes of Alzheimer's disease, such as amyloid beta, tau, and neurofibrary tangles, neuroinflammation, and start partitioning the genome into the subset of regions that are associated with different subphenotypes in each individual, enabling us to reveal very distinct cell types that underlie each of these associations 
and very distinct pathways as well. And we've expanded that to look at electronic health records in the context of genomics to start uh, integrating lab tests, billing uh, codes, doctor notes, prescriptions in the context of a hierarchical model that allows us to integrate all of these different data modalities of the clinical record, start correcting and completing the clinical record, and also start correlating it with genetic variation in these individuals and predicting the specific expression changes that are happening in those individuals using this genotype tissue expression cohort, GTEx. Lastly, we're looking at multi-tissue convergence. In the case of obesity, we're looking at both exercise and diet interventions in both humans and mice and start looking at multiple tissues downstream, including blood, heart, liver, cortex, small intestine, subcutaneous and visceral white adipose tissue, as well as uh, muscle, and inferring a single cell map of these tissues across these different intervention groups. And what we're finding is that the strongest changes are found in adipocyte stem cells, as we saw before with FTO, where it's during early adipocyte differentiation that these uh, variants appear to be acting, and similarly, T cell changes. And we're able to build this cell cell communication network associated with an increase in obesity associated communication. And we're finding that exercise is, in fact, consistently rescuing these effects. That exercise is consistently reversing the effect of overeating by turning on these thermogenic programs. We're able to trace this across individuals and across treatments in the case of cancer immunotherapy, looking at individual patients and all of their tumors and their lineages. And lastly, we're looking at high throughput dissection of the downstream target genes, being able to do a large number of experiments where we modulate, modify each of these genes that we're predicting as targets, developing methods for carrying out 7 million experiments at a time by uh, cutting regions of the DNA that are DNA accessible, inserting them into self-transcribing constructs, and then inserting these constructs into millions of cells and measuring for each of these constructs, what is the level of expression that they're driving for reporter genes, enabling us to now across these different fragments, pinpoint individual regions that we're predicting are drivers of regulatory activity. And indeed these regions are evolutionary conserved and they match individual regulatory motifs. Lastly, we basically developed these programmable and modular constructs using CRISPR-Cas9 to start targeting individual single nucleotide polymorphisms and editing them, or to knock down promoters or genes, or to activate or inhibit individual enhancers. We're differentiating these iPS cells into neurons, microglia, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and then able to, to modulate the expression of predicted driver genes, both in cell cultures as well as in mice, in collaboration with Andreas Fenning at CMU, my former postdoc, who's now testing our predicted driver mutations within these constructs in the brain of mice to start understanding how they're acting in the context of the diversity of cell types in the brain. And that's all I have to say, to say. We basically are building reference epigenomes to predict disease-relevant tissues. We're combining genetic, epigenetic, and transcriptional variation in disease to understand the intermediate path. We're carrying out this single cell dissection of epigenomic and transcriptional impact of these genetic variants and looking for cell type specific genetic effects, as well as multi phenotype and multi tissue integration. And lastly, developing a lot of high throughput methods for dissecting these circuits. This is in the context of an extremely collaborative team. So uh, both computational and experimental scientists uh, working in collaboration with many labs. And I, will, I wanna point out uh, Greek, 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 so uh, there's plenty of room for more Greeks in the group. And uh, again, we're looking for postdocs. Many folks have now uh, left to start their own uh, independent faculty positions at Stanford, at CMU, at uh, Harvard, McGill, and so on and so forth. So we're looking for postdocs. Um, come join us. We're looking for both experimental and uh, computational uh, talented folks. So I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. Great, thank you so much. It is really impressive, uh, all these things that you mentioned. Um, so, yeah, great. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat um, uh, or, you know, speak up. Um, I would like to ask you uh, a question related to 
uh, this, uh, let's say, um, drug design, a circuit um, targeted drug design for Alzheimer or obesity and all these different things that you mentioned, all these different diseases that you mentioned, how far we are from actually uh, realizing this, uh, you know, designing sp specific drugs yeah, no, uh, to, to essentially change the abnormalities that you observe in a certain circuit? So it's a fantastic question. And I, I want to sort of put that in the larger context. On one hand, we're able to trace genetic associations to a single nucleotide variant. Should we go editing genomes? The answer is absolutely no. If we have no idea how things work, maybe that would be the only recourse. But now understanding the circuitry, we're able to intervene at nodes that have much stronger effects. And with the genetic variants are very subtle effects. Otherwise evolution, again, this being a Darwin lecture, would not be tolerating these variants with strong effects. That's why common variants in the genome are associated with very subtle gene regulatory effects instead. So that means that if we actually could edit the genome, we wouldn't necessarily get a big effect. Instead, by understanding the circuitry, understanding the downstream target genes, we can have a much stronger effect. Now, the question is, how do you intervene? The traditional approach has been medicinal chemistry, basically building chemicals across every protein in the genome, and then figuring out how we can use these chemicals to target that particular processing pathway. The challenge there, of course, is that these genes are, and these proteins are acting in many, many tissues in the, in the body. So you might want to sort of target them in the, in the brain and instead they're acting in the liver or you might want to target them in heart and instead they're messing up your brain. So the challenge of tissue specific targeting is enormous. And there are some techniques that we and others are developing by coupling these modifications and these interventions with cell type specific enhancers that will deliver them and that will express them specifically within the cell type of interest. So major, major challenge from the discovery of the circuitry to the validation of the circuitry within the lab, there still remains many, many, many years of mm -hmm. pharmaceutical development to ultimately create the therapeutic. So what we're doing now is building that body of knowledge, that circuitry, but mm -hmm. there's huge work to be done on the uh, pharmaceutical side to mm -hmm. make these circuits come, become therapeutics. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, thank you. Don't be shy, you can... Uh... Can I ask everybody to turn on their video? Uh, I wanna do a group photo here. So even though we're far, far away, I'm about to say this all in an exited video. I want to see you και να με ρωτήσετε ό,τι ερώτηση θέλετε. Γιατί τη στιγμή που βλεπόμαστε, νομίζω ότι είναι πολύ πιο εύκολο κάποιο να ρωτήσει ερώτηση. Η ερώτηση είναι στο χέρι σου. Δόκτωρ Ζούρος, πλήσεις, πάμε. Πλήσεις, ανοίξτε σας. Κύριε Ζούρο, είστε muted. Θέλετε να γίνετε, μπορείτε να κάνετε unmute. Εντάξει, Μαρία. Μπορώ να υποβάλλω. Μανώλη, I guess since you gave your lecture in English, you will also continue in English. This... Όχια γλώσσα θέλετε, δεν υπάρχει πρόβλημα. This answer... Οκ. But you can switch into Greek if you wish, anytime. Um, my question is the following. Uh, there is a lot, a lot misunderstanding and misuse of the word epigenesis and epigenetics, as you probably know. Um, I wonder um, if you would like to give us um, your definition of epigenetics in your work. Is it, is it, is it really... And um, uh, just changes you see that they were environmentally induced. Uh, and how much of it is uh, just environmental and temporary? Uh, and how much of it you think it might be heritable and therefore evolutionary significant? Yeah, so it's, it's a fantastic question. And thank you very much for asking it. Uh, 
I have been very careful in my talk to use the word epigenomic instead of epigenetic. And the, the subtle distinction between the two is that very often epigenetic has to do with genetic, i.e. inheritance, whereas epigenomic, in my language at least, in the way that it's used in the field, has more to do with the decorations of the epigenome, the decorations of the genome to mark uh, gene regulatory elements. So I would say that we're using epigenomics as a tool, as a mechanism to basically be able to define the circuitry of the cells, to define where are the control regions that are active in different tissues and different cell types. Um, however, there's a much larger question of, uh, well, what about epigenetic inheritance? What about environmental impacts on uh, things that might ultimately become heritable? And there I want to caution everyone by reminding, uh, as, you, as you know, that there are two rounds of epigenomic wiping out during the formation of the zygote and during the formation of the gametes. So basically there's a lot of clearing out of epigenomic uh, inheritance that the, our, our cells actively go through to wipe out any such effects of the environment. There are other mechanisms beyond just the histone modification marks, the DNA accessibility, and the DNA manipulation. There are non-coding RNAs, chromatin-associated RNAs, small regulatory RNAs, enhancer RNAs, and other such transcriptional control of the epigenomic landscape that can travel both in some rare cases in the sperm, as well as much more commonly in the egg that has all of the cytoplasm <clears throat> and of course all of the mitochondria of the mother. So you can imagine mechanisms through which RNA generated by, for example, my brain or my liver in response to either, either, either overeating or, I don't know, watching a lot of TV could basically make its way to the germline to ultimately have an impact on the next generation. And there have been very well-documented effects of such transgenerational inheritance where children that were born from starving mothers during the you know, Polish famine, for example, uh, have grown up to have a lot of metabolic syndromes and diabetes and so on and so forth. And you know, there's well-documented cases, but uh, the complete understanding of the science is, is not yet there. And those effects tend to be uh, generally small. So yes, uh, there's some Lamarckian inheritance, uh, you know, despite this being a Darwin lecture, that we are starting to appreciate more and more with epigenetic inheritance. But by and large, the way that we're using epigenomics in my, in my world is for annotating gene regulatory circuitry, and in some rare cases, understanding how much of that is genetically driven and how much of that is non-genetic, where we can basically subtract out the genetic component and then look at the residual and start understanding for the contribution of non-genetic effects. Well, so, so you draw a kind of a line between epigenesis and epigenetic, epigenetic studies. Correct, correct. Basically, you know, I, I want to separate the inheritance component and the epigenomic sort of informational and circuitry inference component. All right, well, I have another question, but I think um, it's, a, it's of a different nature. Oh, oh, before I go to my, I will keep this question later on, um, Manoli. But the other thing that um, makes me a bit worried is how you, con how you can connect single gene um, uh, among, uh, um, information you get from cell culture to phenotype of the individual. So the way that I think about this is in the context of this slide that I showed earlier of the uh, path to disease. In other words, um, when I was talking about bridging the gap between genetic variation and disease, yes, ultimately this is an enormous gap, but by profiling these intermediate variables, we're able to basically ask, what is the effect of a genetic variant on enhancer activity? What is the effect of perturbing that enhancer on gene expression? What is the effect of perturbing that gene on these intermediate phenotypes? And the way that we're thinking about these cell line experiments is that the gene regulatory circuitry at the cell level is preserved. We might not be able to understand in those cells how that gene ultimately acts in disease, but we don't have to solve everything in the same model. 
we can use cell lines to understand, for example, the genetic variants to enhancer connection, to understand the enhancer to gene connection. And then we can go into mouse models to understand the gene to disease connection. So in the example that I showed of the FTO locus, we basically carried out nucleotide alterations in primary adipocytes extracted from the fat of risk carrying individuals. And then that was basically connecting the nucleotide to the gene expression, to the enhancer activity and to the downstream uh, cellular phenotypes. Independently, in a separate set of experiments, we go into mice and we test the effect of that gene alteration on specific phenotypes. So I would say that every part of that circuitry can be dissected in a modular fashion within the appropriate cellular or animal model. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Manoli. I have a question from Eleftheria Varmazi. So thank you for the great talk. I wanted to ask how hard do you think it is for traditional laboratory trained scientists to move to data analysis, epigenomics, and generally more computer-based uh, science. So it's a fantastic question, Eleftheria. And um, I, again, I encourage young trainees uh, who are in this talk, uh, young trainees of all ages, I should, uh, I should emphasize. Uh, I would encourage you to really uh, uh, sign up for machine learning uh, courses. So on my, uh, on my website, I have a series of videos uh, that uh, are freely available on YouTube. If you go to videos, so compbio.mit.edu, comp that's my website, computationbiology.mit.edu uh, slash videos. You can find there all of my uh, courses uh, entirely available for free. So if you wanna learn about machine learning genomics or deep learning in genomics, you can basically find all of my lectures. You can click on any one of these uh, lectures and basically watch Friends, the, uh, the annotated video. To me, it's like, what the f is in your mug? And I'll just tell them. Uh, I have to uh, watch ads for my own videos. But basically, here you can see all of the sort of deep learning material, for example. I have made it fully available uh, for free. So. Uh, there, this is one example of many, 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 uh, you know, such online resources. So all of the materials, all of the videos, all of the lectures uh, are available. I really encourage you to just listen first, absorb, get into the whole mindset, and then actually take some classes that allow you to, to, to get into that. Uh, it will not be lost. I would say that computer science changed the way that I think about the world, the way that I process information, the way that I understand you know, about algorithms, about causality, about, you know, everything, uh, the way that I see the world was, was shaped, I would say, by machine learning and computer science. And it's a transformative experience. I encourage it to all of you. And uh, beyond that, uh, I think there's two sides. One is scripting and writing simple programs to process your own data. And there's a lot of websites where you can do that interactively. The second one is understanding about data mining and data science more broadly. And I think the two are somewhat complementary uh, and both are very much needed. So I think in my classes, I, func I, fo I focus much more on how to think about data science and sort of how to do data analysis and so on and so forth. But then there's the logistics of actually implementing it. And there, I would say understanding the, uh, you know, the data science aspects, but working with computational scientists who can help you with the day-to-day -day sort of logistics of that is probably a good, a good intermediate solution. I see a question from Katerina Hadzaki. Uh, fantastic talk. It seems that you covered with your work all of the aspects of conclusions from data-driven approaches. I was wondering if you would like to comment on unfolding new dimensions insights on the role of non-coding areas of the genome. So, uh, what are the direction that we're going to now? So, I mean, as you saw, uh, during the talk, I basically went through increasing complexity. Like, you know, we want to understand the function of a single genetic variant acting, say, in microglia, but in the context of the circuitry of the brain, in the context of all the different brain regions, but also in the context of the lipid metabolism from your liver, from your blood, from your, you know, uh, endocrine system, and so on and so forth. So, 
what we're moving towards is a much more systemic systems level view of disease where we can basically take the processes that are leading to disease across the different tissues and partition that complexity into a modular view of all of the different components. The way that I like to think about it is that instead of thinking of Alzheimer's as a monolithic disorder, we can basically think about the quote unquote buckets that every Alzheimer's variant is uh, impacting. And I, I tried to allude to that a little bit <clears throat> in uh, this slide here, where we looked at neuritic plaques associated with amyloid beta, neurofibrillary tangles associated with tau, neuroinflammation associated with microglia as separate signatures of Alzheimer's. And then you can think of each person as having a different burden of these different signatures. Each person having a different burden on these different buckets that ultimately lead to Alzheimer's. You can think of these 10 buckets. So every person has genetic variants, environmental insults, and all kinds of you know, behavioral nutritional contributors to lipid dysregulation, to DNA damage, to neuronal uh, death, to um, you know, microglia overactivation, to amyloid transport, et cetera. And I, you know, sort of the, the increasing view that we have in my lab is that um, if we understand these buckets within which these genetic epigenomic transcriptional and cellular dysregulations are falling, we can then start thinking about basket trials where we can tune therapeutics to each individual based on the specific set of buckets that we need to address and for some individuals, lipid level interventions will be more important. For other individuals, amyloid level intervention might be more important. So that's sort of the, the view that we're starting to have now, the, this sort of systems level modular decomposition of the genotype to phenotype map through the layers of the epigenome, the transcriptome and the single cell profiling. All right, Paolo is asking, thank you for the amazing talk. I was wondering, in light of what you described about epigenetics, does the gene expression encapsulate slash summarize the predictive power necessary for predictive analysis? In other words, are traditional studies based on gene expression alone relevant at all in modern bioinformatics? So the problem with a lot of these traditional gene expression-based studies is that they are at the tissue level. So when you're seeing the expression of a gene changing with disease, it could just simply reflect changes in the cell type composition that happens during the disease rather than changing the expression of that gene in any one of those cell types. It could also be that the way that you dissected the tissue included more glia than the neurons for that particular subregion of the brain. And what you're seeing is just changing in the dissection. I think uh, the, 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 the data that we have now on single cell expression change associated with disease addresses some of that Sort of tissue decomposition uh, aspect, but the question still remains how much of that is captured by the epigenome, the transcriptome, the cellular signatures, and so on and so forth. Uh, how much should we do lipidomics, metabolomics? How much should we be looking at the microbiome? And the answer is all of the above. In other words, uh, for different genetic regions, there might be uh, a path that's more strongly through the transcription. For others, it might be strongly through the lipids. And for you know, uh, others, it might be a combination of them, as I tried to show in, in sort of one of the, one of the slides. So I, I would say uh, more data is always better. The more variables you can measure, uh, the, the more likely you are to understand the causal path. But we should never say, oh, we don't have every single variable. Let's stop. Because even with a subset of variables, you can still start understanding what are the involved pathways what are the relevant genes and circuits. And then once you have a hypothesis, go and measure more variables, you know, very closely related to that hypothesis. So Christos Delidakis is asking, how has data-driven science helped understand the evolution of animal genomes, especially the dark regions of the genome, repetitive elements, et cetera, and their fun uh, possible functionality? So I would say an enormous amount. I mean, this is the place where data science has made the you know, strongest impact. So my work, I would say, is all about the dark regions of the genome. It's, it, but, but again, they're not dark to us anymore. We now understand the enhancers, the promoters, the regulatory motifs, the upstream regulators, the circuits. And yes, there's a huge chunk of the genome that's repetitive elements, but many of these repetitive elements have now been co-opted to have gene regulatory roles. And they're not dark anymore. We can use 
chromatin immunoprecipitation, we can use uh, DNA accessibility, we can use this ataxy, you know, the assay for transposes accessible chromatin uh, to basically figure out when are these regions, even when they're embedded within ancient repeat elements, when are these regions turning on and turning off in different cell types? And then what is the circuitry? So I don't think of the genome as dark anymore. I think of them as a set of circuits associated with every genomic loci. And if you understand the genetic variants acting in that region, you can then map them onto the circuits and then start tracing their impact in different cell types. So um, as for animal uh, genome evolution, if you look at human and chimp, we're basically 99% identical. I mean, it's, it's incredibly close. And if you look at the proteins, there's you know, hardly any changes. The vast majority of changes that are happening between a human and chimp, and we are dramatically different species, are in the circuitry. Basically, whether you keep a particular enhancer active for longer might be in, you know, influencing the amount of cortical development that you have. So there has been this tenfold expansion of the frontal cortex and the neocortical regions in primates and specifically in human. Uh, you know, we have a thousand times more neurons than mice have, and a lot of that is just the circuitry. It's, it's the, you know, how much you keep that gene expressed rather than, you know, the, the building blocks of the proteins. I, you know, I don't think we have invented that many new proteins at all in the course of mammalian evolution. Now, uh, please, please unmute and uh, follow up. Can I, can I follow up? Yeah. A quick question. I was thinking mostly of... Uh, two similar animals in complexity, uh, for example, Drosophila and an arthropod. And one has 100 megabases of genome and the other one has 3000 megabases of genome. So I would say, you know, take the onion. <laughs> the yeah. onion has a genome that's, I think, 10 times larger than the human genome. That's not because, you know, they have immense cognition. And if you look at, you know, what humans need for cognition, it's a small number of genes. We've just expanded this basic hardware of mammals and primates to just enormous levels of uh, just hardware expansion. You don't need that many genes for that. Uh, the reason why some genomes are enormous is because they tolerate uh, repeat elements much more. If you look at a virus, why are they so small? Because the rate of replication and the packaging of that virus is the rate limiting step. If you look at bacteria, how fast you replicate when sugar is in the environment, you know, tells you a lot about the evolution. If you look at humans, you know, replication rate is not an issue. I mean, it's like getting out of college. We're talking about 20 years rather than, you know, milliseconds or, or minutes. So the time scales at which evolution is acting uh, can basically lead to much more tolerance of, you know, massive amounts of repeat elements. And then, you know, that basically can lead to dramatic genome size differences, uh, something, uh, you know, that, that many sort of, have theorized a lot about, but there's no theorizing anymore that's needed. I think we now have the genome. We understand what are the number of genes, the number of connections, the number of proteins, the number of interactions. We can sort of study all that in a very quantitative fa uh, fashion and sort of kind of ignore the, the regions of the genome that are just, you know, not appearing to be turning on or off or uh, involved in any of these processes. All right, Thalia is asking, uh, in light of all the data available, what percentage of the genome do you think is junk? Oh gosh, we have talked about this so, so far. It depends at what resolution you're looking at it. In other words, if you have a gene regulatory element here and there's binding of a giant transcription factor that is turning on a 1000 nucleotide enhancer, are you counting the thousand nucleotides as functional? Or are you counting the you know, five motifs within that region as functional? So if you look at comparative genomics, you know, about five to 10% of the human genome that appears to be selected between different mammals. But again, you know, humans have a lot of new regulatory elements and have lost a lot of previous regulatory elements and mice have a lot of new regulatory elements just like chimps do and so, so forth. In other words, the non-coding genome evolves a lot. You can't just simply say, aha, this is evolutionary conserved, therefore this is the only part that's functional. Moreover, if you look at Alzheimer's disease, you know, a lot of the phenotypes are manifesting in late life. That doesn't necessarily have an impact on the selective advantage of that animal after it has already had its offspring. So there's um, you know, a lot of additional context within which to understand you know, what you call by junk and what fraction is uh, quote unquote functional. I would say it doesn't really matter. As I mentioned earlier, you, know, you, can have, you can tolerate a huge amount of bogus stuff in the genome. 
bigger is not necessarily better. It's not because, oh, humans are special because we have more DNA. No, we don't. The onion has much more DNA than us. It's because we basically had the right environment where particular traits were selected. And those traits sometimes take a very small number of genes and, or, or a very small number of regulatory elements to become uh, active. If you look at a bat and how it's flying through dark caves, I would argue that it's much more complex than you know, any behavior that humans might have in, our, in their perception of a three-dimensional world around them with a collocation, et cetera. If you look at dolphins, if you look at ants, if you look at, you know, there's just enormous complexity in the biological world. We happen to be the species that A, has dominated this planet through our, you know, brain, and uh, B, is the only species that has actually sequenced its own genome <laughs> and is able to communicate, you know, has complex language, abstract thought, et cetera. All of that is just a bunch of neocortical region expansions. Uh, and, uh, you know, that makes us special on the cognitive side, but there's so many different other dimensions where animals are far superior, quote unquote, to humans. So, you know, I, um, anyway. Uh, and then the last question, Maria Papadopouli, you're dealing with dynamic multi-graph data due to the various interplays among the entities, neurons, RNA profiles. What are the most powerful algorithmic tools that you're using to discover the most important structures, circuits that have prominent predictive impact? Uh, the, I mean, many, many students are asking me, hey, you know, I have this super fast algorithm that can go through millions of regulatory networks fa much, much faster. You know, am I in better shape? And my answer is very often not necessarily because you're testing a lot more hypotheses and therefore you're much more likely to find something bogus and find spurious associations. So I would say that the rate limiting step is not necessarily how fast we can sort of shift through all of these circuits, it's not necessarily how fast our algorithms are. It's much more how precise are our network models, how precise are the circuits that we're building. And uh, weeding out a lot of noise is way, way more important than cranking through possibilities much, much faster. So I would say err on the side of smaller data sets and smaller variables and few, you know, fewer variables, um, rather than on the side of sort of faster algorithms that can run through them uh, more rapidly. Thank you. All right, last question just came in from Ioannis Fotopoulos. How far are we from discovering highly associated genomics and epigenomics to a given disease at global level? Essentially, how much able are we in generalizing and, event and evaluating a therapeutic discovery on the whole population, correcting for the existence of biological differences exhibited at DNA levels between people across different countries? Thank you for the presentation, it was very informative. So, uh, Ioanni, uh, this is, um, again, a fantastic question. A lot of the genetic associations that we are using are unfortunately found in European populations, European ancestry individuals. Uh, so we are, you know, not very diverse in the ability to sort of take these and apply them to every uh, population out there. The difference between, uh, you know, any two European individuals is you know a tiny little subset of the difference between any two African individuals because there's the African population is much more diverse to start with and a tiny part of that population basically went off to colonize the rest of the world so if you look at African genome for example you can get a lot more bang for your buck by sort of understanding variation there and the impact of these changes in uh, humans that are that are much more diverse Moreover, when it comes to issues of equity and, you know, access and, and sort of being able to make the fruits of genomics available to the whole planet, then we have to really embrace sort of African genomes, you know, Asian genomes, uh, South American genomes, and so, so forth. So I think that's something that the NIH has recognized. There's a lot of uh, push from the NIH by us and many others to basically expand the tools to more diverse uh, populations. Uh, but I want to reassure you that many of these circuits are, in fact, very, very highly conserved between uh, different human populations. So I would say, you know, the vast majority of the inferences that we're making uh, are, in fact, pan-human. And a small minority will be, uh, you know, specific to only one population. I mentioned earlier, for example, that the FTO risk allele for obesity rose from 2% frequency in Africa to 44% frequency in Europe. This could be drift because, you know, maybe the subset of individuals that left Africa had more of this FTO locus uh, allele uh, that, that predisposes you to obesity. Uh, the alternative explanation is that obesity hasn't always been a problem. In fact, obesity was a feature when you had much more starvation 
and in periods of uh, food scarcity, that allele was probably beneficial, uh, you know, allowing you to store a higher percentage of the calories in your diet. So when you exited Africa and you went to these harsher conditions, it may have actually been selected for, uh, you know, leading to its increase in, in, in prevalence. So we have to basically start thinking of the environmental context in which these allele frequencies have changed and shifted. And you know, for some loci, there are dramatic differences in the allele frequencies between different populations, in the uh, recombination hotspots and haplotype block boundaries between different populations. That can be an advantage and a feature when, you, when trying to sort of map genetic associations to functional loci, because they will be slightly different between different populations, enabling you to start fine mapping genetically rather than just simply functionally. Um, but uh, for the vast majority of loci, they are conserved. And therefore, a lot of the insights that we're making should apply to every individual uh, on the planet. Moreover, the circuits that we're finding are not necessarily always genetic. Most of the time, we're starting from the genetics, we're finding the circuit, and that circuit will then apply whether or not you have that genetic variant. So we found a circuit for obesity. It's not help, just helpful for me and, and the other sort of homozygous individuals. It's helpful for everyone, regardless of what you know, environmental or genetic or combination factors are pushing into obesity. Understanding the circuits and manipulating them allows you to combat it for all. All right, I have a meeting that started eight minutes ago, so I should take off. But uh, thank, thank you so much. It is a, an amazing, it was an amazing talk and extremely thoughtful um, answers to our questions. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for your questions, and then uh, see you again. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Ευχαριστώ όλους για την παρουσία σας και τη συμμετοχή. Να είστε καλά.